I'm Dan Zurich. I'm over in the Department of Biology. I've been here since 98. And the course that I used these iPads for was an advanced senior level or graduate course called Advanced Cellular and Molecular Biology which is a sort of intimidating name, but what we do is we study the current literature in the field. So it's different every semester. It's driven by student interest. And so this is very much a discussion style course. And obviously media like this is just gold for a course like that. Should I start? Absolutely. Okay. All right. So just introduce the course. And uh, different students every semester, different literature. Uh-oh. Did you go to sleep? There we go. There we go. OK. Oh, technology. Um, different literature every semester. Now, um, looking at the primary literature, obviously it's changing all the time. And the technological resources we've got are changing all the time. So when I started teaching this course at Pitt State back in 1998, the technology we had available was the photocopier. Now, just imagine how exciting it is to read something like this and then find yourself confronted with a figure like this. Let me assure you, it's no more clear from up here than it is back there. So uh, it's a little bit difficult to get students excited about this sort of thing. Eh, you know, OK, we'll do it. But uh, really, another stack of papers, more trees died. Um, another option we had available was this. This is from my personal subscription. You can only subscribe to so many magazines, of course, because you guys have seen what the price looks like for those subscriptions. I'll talk about that a little bit more, because there's, there's two, two phases to that. And this is good, except for the part where you're trying to point things out to people. And sure, you can pass the magazine around, but how much can you talk about when everybody has to stare at all those individual little figures and try and figure out exactly what's going on here? Sure, you can cluster everybody around. Uh, you can make a photocopy off of this and put it on an overhead, but that's not really the way to go. So with the iPads, what we were um, able to do was to have everybody have a copy of the PDFs available on their, uh, on their iPads so everybody could look at the individual figures. Now, one of the tools that I used was I do have my individual subscription to Science Magazine, and I like this one because it's broad and it's got introductions for people who aren't experts in the field, which is nice. I'm a plant scientist. Most of my students aren't even slightly interested in plant stuff, and in fact, talking them to eat and eat their vegetables is probably going to be a losing battle. I send them to family and consumer sciences for nutrition from time to time. But you've got this available through the iPad. It uses a slightly annoying program called Zinnia, which is being used for a lot of different magazines now. but. Um, that's the deal that they've got. It's a little slow to load. But what you get, and oh, here we go. Grand challenges in science education. That was my most recent issue that came through, coincidentally. You can go through, and then you are able, whoops, why did you go away from me? Stop it. Stop helping me. Dang it. Come on. Stop helping me. OK. So that's OK. That's fine. I don't need to worry about that. There we go. And here we've got different things that are available. Of course, you have to deal with the advertisements as well. But you can actually end up getting into the various articles that they've got in here and find various things that you can look at and go through. So uh, right now, it's being a little bit slow. So let me show you some of the sorts of articles that we had and show you what the difference is between our overheads and what photocopies looked like. Okay. Are you going to open? Are you going to open? I think you should stay. Yeah, I did. It usually opens automatically, but I will make it. Whoa, come on. <laughs> you opened five minutes ago. This is one of the challenges of technology. And in fact, on the day that we were setting up our iPads, uh, yep, Pitt State's website wasn't working, and we weren't <laughs> able to actually register them the first class. So that was, so that was where we ended up with that. OK. Open. Why are you not opening? Well, fine. You can open. I'll open this one instead.
So this allows us to see things in far more detail. That's a lot better. Everybody can, oh, now you open that one. Okay. This was an interesting paper that cured a guy's leukemia, a fatal leukemia. It was the first test. And in fact, there is a kid in town who is getting this very therapy right now. Jim Triplett is a friend of her father, and he was asking me, had I ever heard of this therapy? Yep, we covered it last semester. And so they actually used a modified HIV virus to do it. So you can get details like this. You can see this beautiful stuff there. Everybody can see it at the same time. And like I said, I am a plant scientist. So when I want to talk about things that my students are interested in, I'm looking at things like this and I'm going, what is a lentiviral viral vector? I can take that. I can copy it on my iPad. I'm using my laptop right now, but I can use it on my iPad. And I can go to Google and I can go find out exactly what I might need to know. Come on, screen resolution is always an issue. There we go. That's the stuff that we want over there. And I can go to a site like Wikipedia. All right. There we go. And we can sit there and we can discuss all these sorts of things, which is pretty cool. Now, another thing that we end up seeing, and we can find associated things that we might be interested in looking at. Now, along with the price that we pay for our subscriptions, one of the things that you run into is when you publish an article, you have to pay for it as well. And when you're publishing color figures, which there's no other way to do these other than using color to actually see what's there, color figures are excessively expensive. So what we're finding in more and more of the literature today is that people are only printing many of their critical figures online because it's cheaper. And when you read the paper version, they say, see the supplemental online figures, which require a separate subscription to the magazine that costs extra money most of the time because usually you are subscribing to a print version or an online version. And so as you're going through the paper and you're trying to critically analyze it, you hit one of those spots, and if you don't have online access, you have to go, well, I guess we just have to take their word for it that they actually showed that. And it's been peer-reviewed. Probably it will be safe, but that is not a good way to teach people how to critically analyze the current literature. So that ends up being a difficulty. One of the other things that we are able to get off of this, and this was the paper that was, there we go, got it open. There are a lot of scientists right now who are looking at the fact that it costs so much to access publicly funded research and saying, why doesn't the public have a right to see this? Why should this be, be behind such a big paywall? And so they have started organizations like this, PLOS One, Public Library of Science One, only available online, of course, easy to access with an iPad which not all of our students have, and they don't all have laptops. And this is free access to publicly funded literature. And in fact, this is a growing wave within the scientific field, where you are seeing more and more scientists approaching, hey, why don't we make it like Facebook so everybody can see our stuff and start critiquing it and use the information we've got and let the information flow. <coughs> the publishers are fighting it like mad. But I think we can take an example of what happened with the record industry and see where we think this story is going to end. So the iPads were a great help for this. It certainly doesn't hurt that they're cool, that they're sleek, that you get a contact buzz just from touching one or even looking at one. And so that got the students uh, absolutely pulled in. But being able to access online materials, not having to rely on blurry photocopies, access the supplementary materials, all of this was um, really pretty wonderful stuff. And they can look the stuff up they don't understand themselves instead of listening to me blather, as all of you are doing right now. <laughs> so anyway, that's what I have to say about my experience with the iPad. Lynette, thank you very much. This was a great experience. I loved this. And thank all of you for giving me the chance to, to do it. Absolutely. So what do you have for questions? Yeah. Can you explain 
<laughs> this one? I don't think we have that kind of class. Enroll in this class. Yeah, this was an interesting one. So you've heard of mad cow disease, which can give, make people quite sick. We don't have anything to treat it. This is a possible, possible cure for people with Creutzfeldt-Jakob or mad cow disease, prion diseases. So, you know, the, the first line of defense is that a mind is a terrible thing to taste. But if you get past that point and you've picked up one of these diseases, and this article talked about a possibility for, hey, there might be not a cure, but at least a treatment, which nobody had had before, which was one of the reasons I picked it. My first thought was camel antibodies, really. But there was meat in the article, and it was, it was fun to do. Thank you very much. My pleasure. If I have to duck out, thank you. Don't take it personally. I have a class of freshmen to go illuminate, so I will need well, we to. Appreciate you taking your time I'm happy to do it. To share that with us I today. really enjoyed this opportunity, and I'm happy to tell everybody what a great experience it was. So, those of you who've done this, I mean, you know. So. Okay. Well, my name is Jamie McDaniel, and I'm an assistant professor over in the English department. And I used uh, the 10 iPads that I received in English 501, uh, which is a document design. I want to talk uh, just briefly a little bit about the document design class. And it's primarily a visual rhetoric and design theory focused class with several application assignments built into the course. And just to plug it a little bit, if you have any students who you think this might be interesting for, uh, I am teaching it again in the fall. And I uh, just got a grant to purchase uh, this iGUIDE equipment, which can be used to uh, perform usability testing on on uh, websites and other documents. So it should be a fun class using even more uh, uh, fun technology. So um, but the, the course is a core class in our technical and professional writing emphasis in English. And because of what businesses are asking technical and professional writers to do these days, I personally take a comprehensive approach to defining document. And I include in that definition print documents such as brochures and flyers and forms, uh, but then also audio visual documents, video documents such as YouTube videos are, uh, as you'll see momentarily, a promotional public service announcement that we made uh, for our uh, service learning partners. And then finally, uh, digital documents such as, such as websites. And this past semester, I also revised the course. We had not really been discussing very much project management or client management in our program. So I integrated elements of, of those two um, items into the course, as well as looking at uh, new media and Web 2.0 applications, such as using blogs for professional purposes or using content management systems. And uh, so I, starting out, I, I had three goals for, for my students. I wanted to increase their, their comfort and skill level with using new media and Web 2.0 applications, such as the iPad and, and the apps that, that they used. Uh, and not just using them, but using them specifically in professional contexts, and especially in document design. I also wanted to increase their skills in using this technology for uh, client management and project management, so how, how to deal with all these documents and how to communicate with clients. Uh, and then finally, and perhaps most importantly, uh, fostering a collaboration between the community and Pittsburgh State University. So those were my three goals. And uh, I set up a service learning project. It was pretty much the entire semester, except for maybe the first three or four weeks of class, in which I divided the students into two groups. Uh, one group worked with CCAP, which is the Southeast Kansas Community Action Program, and Becky Gray over at, at CCAP, as well as the Writing Center here on campus. And we produced uh, several, several different documents for them, as, as you'll see. 
So my first goal of increasing students' comfort level with a new media and Web 2.0 and professional context, uh, how did I get them more comfortable? Uh, well, one of the first ways that I uh, tried to help them become more comfortable was giving them links to training videos online. In addition to an in-class uh, tutorial that I had, uh, but you know, there's so much that you can do with the iPad and so many apps out there. If I took class time to go over every single aspect of every single possible app they might use, that's the class. So I, I went and I tried to pick the best tutorials for the main, the main apps that we used um, and, and posted those on Canvas. And my students found those useful. Also, I was lucky enough to have someone in my class who had an iPad and had had one for about a year, uh, Michelle Fields, and she was very good with it. And she kind of took on a, a TA role in, in that respect and uh, was constantly helping others in class when they had questions um, to, uh, about apps or about using the iPad. And then finally, and I, uh, this is how I learned to use my iPad. I wanted to emphasize the importance of play and not just the Angry Birds kind of play, <laughs> but just going into a new app that maybe you're unfamiliar with and seeing what you can do with it, taking it for a test drive and uh, uh, just playing with, with the technology uh, can help you learn the technology. So I did a very uh, probably unscientific survey of my students uh, before we got the iPads as well as after. And there were 10 students in the course, so not a very big sample size. But uh, at the beginning of the course, 30% of the students said that they were comfortable or very comfortable with using Web 2.0 and new media. And then at the end, when all of the students said that they felt comfortable or very comfortable. Uh, with using Web 2.0 and new media in professional contexts. So moving on to my uh, next uh, objective, increasing the student skills in using technology for project and client management. And this was, as I said, a new addition to the course. And uh, you know, we used, used this in a, a few ways, particularly through the use of apps such as Dropbox or the Canvas app. Uh, because of those two apps and several others, the iPad became a kind of one-stop shop uh, for all of the resources that they needed uh, to complete the projects, as well as for the client. Uh, s additionally, students could institute very quick changes to projects using mock-up apps or using uh, PDF markup apps uh, to uh, gain feedback from clients that they could just write down on the app itself, on the document itself. And I know several of them, several of the students use that. And then finally, and my students said, this is probably the most important point, uh, that everyone in the class was on the same playing field in terms of technology. And you know, our students have very busy lives outside of school. And in a technology intensive course like this one or uh, some of the classes out at the Tech Center, it might be very difficult for people to come into a computer lab uh, to use the Adobe software in Design and Illustrator. Uh, and it's prohibitively, prohibitively expensive uh, for, for many students. So there were a lot of apps that uh, there is a Photoshop app. Uh, there are other. Uh, 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 page layout apps as well that students used either instead of lab time, so they used those apps to make their documents, or they used it to prepare for lab time and then they would come into the lab more prepared than they, they would ordinarily. <coughs> so uh, at the beginning uh, of the course, 10% of students, one student, felt very comfortable or comfortable with using technology for project management and client management. And then afterwards, 80% of the students felt co very comfortable or comfortable uh, with using technology for project and client management. 
So finally, uh, fostering the collaboration between the community here in Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh State University, I uh, found two clients. Uh, first was CCAP, in which we produced a series of documents promoting their poverty simulation, uh, which some of you may have heard of or, or attended even. Uh, they've had several of them. Uh, as well as uh, the PSU Writing Center promoting uh, the Writing Center and use of the Writing Center. And using real clients in the service learning opportunity really helped the students understand how to use this kind of technology in professional ways, as opposed to again just downloading Angry Birds or Words with Friends or, or whatnot, or Facebooking. Uh, <coughs> So some examples of the work that the students produced. Uh, this is a promotional uh, mailer flyer uh, for, um, or it's a flyer for the poverty simulation. And this is a trifold tabletop for, for the writing center. They also get to do not so pretty documents uh, with with forms and they actually had to make a print form and then remediate that into an online digital form uh, in some way so this is the print version of it there was also a digital version of that which they used uh, different apps to create that digital version and then they also did mock-ups of iPad or iPhone apps and this is a mock-up uh, so it's not usable but it would, it's a layout, it's a kind of a, a abstract version of what, a, what an app would look like for uh, the packed bus system, system for, for CCAP and how we would know where the buses are. And uh, you know, this, is, this is a class about design. Um, and then uh, the, our colleagues out at the tech center can make this happen <laughs> and do the programming. Um, so uh, about 70% or 70% of students were very likely or likely to volunteer with a community or campus organization in the next six months before taking this class. And that number didn't necessarily change, but I know it was a great experience for, for all of the students um, involved. And uh, they also found other ways to use it. Uh, Alex Shepard, uh, who's sitting there next to me. Uh, he uh, accompanied me to the Council for Programs in Technical and Scientific Communication, CPTSC, uh, a conference in, at Michigan Tech, uh, and he spoke about using iPads in the classroom, and he used his iPad to give his presentation. So that was really great. But I think the, the highlight of the, of the experience for the students and, and for me personally what were the video documents that they made and uh, I'm going to show one one in, they're very short uh, one right now uh, and this is the promotional PSA that uh, one of the groups made for the PSU Writing Center and they used and edited this film using the iPad uh, as well as some additional equipment that we have over in the English department but they primarily use the iPad GarageBand iMovie and some other apps so Hopefully this will this will work. Really knows what his or her paper is about, or if they're having trouble with it. 
that they were passionate about it, they would have some ideas about core. So it seems they were telling me what their group was about and what they intended before I even read it. That kind of gives me a general idea. I should also say one of the students composed the music in the background. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and there are the students from that group. Uh, you can see the other one, uh, the CCAP promotional PSA, on the English department website. It's up there on the main page right now. Uh, and you can actually see their other work as well uh, at pittstatetechwriters.com. Uh, and that was a website they produced using a content management system for, for the class. Okay. So that's, that's it. <laughs> Um, I'm Amber Tankersley, and I'm in the Department of Family and Consumer Sciences, and I teach early childhood development. I was really excited to uh, participate in the iPad project um, last fall. I had received an iPad as a surprise Christmas gift from my husband um, the year before, so I was still new at getting um, my feet wet with um, technology. Uh, I had an unusually small group of students who had enrolled for my developmental planning course, which is basically um, a methods and materials course for early childhood. Uh, I'm also director of the preschool program, so I, I, three to five year old kids are what I deal with, and then college students, which sometimes are no less difficult than three to five year old children. But I had um, six uh, students enrolled in my developmental planning course, so I thought, okay, this would be a good opportunity for um, me to try um, incorporating the iPad with um, this group of students. It also has a lab component. Not only are they enrolled in the 490, um, which is the lecture portion where we talk about the different um, learning domains that they're going to be planning for, um, they actually carry over their activities into the lab, so it's essentially two classes got the benefit of um, this iPad project. And Marty York and I actually shared some students. We had a student that was in her class and in mine, which worked out beautifully because I had a last minute addition to my class. I had five and then ended up with six. Um, what I hoped my students would gain from this experience, one, uh, was to prepare them for the use of technology. Um, Preschool age kiddos are coming from homes where an iPad or an iPhone is handed to them and they're used to being on um, all different types of technology. We wanted um, my students to be comfortable with that. Uh, I also wanted them to be able to integrate using um, technology in developmentally appropriate ways, ways that fit the needs of the children instead of saying, oh, here, cool, look at this new toy, play with it for a little bit. I wanted them to actually be able to use it and I wanted them to discover how to use um, the iPad as a tool. I never thought I would give away my paper calendar until I got my iPad, and I kept it for a little while, um, and I would go back and forth, and finally I gave it up. I am amazed at how much organization can be held in this little sleek thing. Um, my class, um, 
one of the first activities that we do in class, we do a junk activity. Um, if you're not familiar with early childhood people, we're essentially hoarders because early childhood people typically do not make a whole lot of money, um, but we want to do really cool things with kids, so we save applesauce containers and toilet paper tubes. Um, so one of the activities that I do with my students, I bring in this bag of junk that, for you guys it would be junk, but for early childhood people we're like, oh my gosh, do you have more of these? Um, and everybody selects um, an item out of the bag and they have to come up with a way to use that with children. And it's, you know, it, it's toilet paper tubes, it's detergent scoops, it's really fun for us. But again, I'm aiding the hoarding epidemic. Um, we talked about how we use things that are cheap, we use things that um, are common in early childhood classrooms. But then I told them that you're going to have to get used to using some new technology, using some new things. And then this is where it gets really hokey. Um, I wrapped the iPads, they weren't new, but they didn't know it. Um, I wrapped them like gifts and I handed them to them and they were so excited, they had no idea what they were getting. And they unwrapped them and th this is my class after they had unwrapped um, their presents um, because it was essentially a gift for them to use for the semester. Um, some of them got really excited and thought, they got to keep it forever, and I'm like, no, 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 you have to give this back. Um, uh, it was <coughs> eye-opening um, to see them sit there and look at it and realize that my class really didn't know what to do with it yet. They weren't sure how to turn it on. Um, only one other person had an iTunes account, so they, we were starting fresh. Um, so we had an introduction, I told them, like we would do with young kids, anytime we give kids something new, they have to have time to play with it. They have to have time to manipulate and see what it'll do before we can ever ask them to do anything with it. Um, so that's the discovery part. I said, you know, let's get everybody set up. Um, let's see what you can find out. And it was really fun. Um, the first couple of days that they had those and they came back to class, they were, you know, they would talk about an app they had found or um, I figured out how to get on Facebook and that Angry Birds thing is really cool. Um, <laughs> So they discovered a lot of things, and then I started incorporating it into our lesson planning that we do um, for the preschool kids. Um, it was really neat. This group of students, um, they were in the preschool, but our afternoon preschool class, all of our student teachers, a different class, that were in um, the preschool were all in Marty's class, so we had iPads in the preschool everywhere and that in the preschool has an iPad so we were still trying to figure out how to use it without just saying hey this is cool Let's see what you can do on it um, so I really wanted to be really intentional with how um, these students were incorporating the use of the iPad uh, we did a lot of they would have their iPads and we were talking about something and somebody would look it up so we had a lot of in-class searches see what you can find out about this uh, we had accidental moments where we found that we could use an app for something or somebody would mention, oh, I found an app that really goes along with what we're talking about. We had some, you know, accidental um, issues. I ended up putting a um, section on um, our Canvas site that was called Appapalooza. Again, I'm early childhood. It, it works for us. Um, and anytime they found an app that they would forget to talk about in class, they would put, you know, describe where to find it. Um, and put it up there and that was kind of a nice repository for um, the apps that they might be using. They had to incorporate um, the use of the iPad in um, their different lesson plans and they plan activities in the language domain, cognitive domain, um, the aesthetic domain within the arts and music. Um, we do some activities within the social domain and then the physical domain. Um, I started them off small and um, it grew and they started finding ways to incorporate um, the iPad without being told, which was kind of nifty. So some of the things that we found out, um, we found out there's a lot of really neat language apps for young children. Um, kids like flashes and lights and colors and they like to hear somebody else's voice reading a story besides mom or dad or, or my teacher. Um, so we found a lot of really neat um, apps that were stories. Um, we found some neat apps that were story creators and I have a picture of one of my students doing that here in a minute. Um, one of the things that I told my students, I told them to be very cheap 
and frugal, and I did not require them to buy anything. I know some of them did, but I told them, just like saving those toilet paper tubes, let's see what free things we can find. And I, for the most part, everything we did um, revolved around um, free apps. So we found a lot of language apps um, when they uh, were presenting their lesson plans in class, which was great for such a small group of students. Um, every time they create a lesson, they, they share it with everybody. Um, with their activities that we did with the iPad, we were able to plug in and go through and see how it functions and talk about, well, would this work with this group of kids that we're dealing with, or what would you do about little Timmy, and how's he going to handle this? Um, it worked really well. This was a story creator um, that was a little bit older than what would probably work for most of our preschool kids, um, but it was a app that the kids picked out different aspects of a story. Um, there were uh, multiple story apps where the kids could choose a different ending or add their name into it and then it would read it to you in the end. A lot of really neat um, opportunities with creating their own stories. Um, our, my students still had to create hands-on materials that were not electronic, but then they started incorporating, well here I am creating my flannel board, um, I'm going to show my students the story that goes along with it. So we had a lot of um, iPad use that I really didn't think about, which was fun. We had some nice um, counting apps which helped us with our assessment in the preschool. This was just simply a um, you know, touch the square and it counts for you and it didn't matter what order the children went in to um, make the numbers appear, uh, but it was great for um, to give our students an opportunity to count something that was different than our little counting bears or other than counting animal crackers at the table. Um, it gave them an opportunity to do something a little bit different and for us to see how we can gather information about what the kids are learning and what they understand at this point. Great matching games. Eric Carle is a great early childhood um, author and there's actually a really neat, it's called My First App, but it's Eric Carle and it has some really neat matching games for the kids, which was great with our math um, units that we were doing. Um, you could set it to have more cards or fewer cards, depending on the age of child that you were working with. And it was very positive reinforcement for the kids with what they would say when you made a match, which was nice. Um, my favorite app that I found, and I'm the one that found this, and no, we didn't really incorporate its use um, in the preschool, there is an app called Project Noah, and because we were trying to find some apps that would go along with science, this was uh, an app that you could actually put on your iPhone or an iPad and take children on like a nature walk into your backyard or on the playground. And if they saw a bird or a bug that they didn't know what it was, you could take a picture of it using the device, and it would help you search to see what type of animal that was. Um, you could use GPS to figure out <coughs> where you were, um, and based on your experiences, you gained patches, which for some kids, getting those little electronic patches would be highly motivating to go explore outside. Yes, we're taking some technology, but we're getting them outside and seeing some new things, uh, which I thought was really neat. Um, I still have it on my iPad. I still play with it every now and then. I've taken pictures of bugs at home that... Unfortunately, they didn't know what they were still, so, but that's okay. Uh, when we did our music, um, this was probably one of my most favorite um, domains when we did the aesthetic domain because of the options to bring in really cool instruments, not that the xylophone's really cool, but really cool instruments to the kids that they may not have had access to. We have one little xylophone in the preschool, but we could have 10 of them now because we have you know, multiple students with iPads. Um, yes, there's advertisements on this one because we were cheap and we didn't spring for the full out version, but this sounds just like the little kid plinky um, xylophone. Uh, we didn't use like GarageBand, but there's a lot of apps that have some um, drums and some really um, unique instruments that the kids can explore at least the sound. They are not getting that hands-on feel of it, um, but the sound of the different instruments, which we thought was a neat way to um, extend our resources. Uh, within the social domain, uh, we found a really neat app that was actually put out by, by Sesame Street. We learned a lot of things about picking apps and if we knew it was a um, Oh, an organization that really promoted what we thought was best practices for early childhood. Their apps tended to be better. We, we learned that um, 
you can kind of judge an app by its cover sometimes that they don't, if they doesn't look really great right there, it may not be that great. Um, but Sesame Street, when we were talking about um, the social domain and how children um, are dealing with emotions, um, they had a great app for military families and how children um, are dealing with deployments or homecomings. I've used this in every class that I've taught. I've used this app uh, recently. Um, Elmo talks about how he um, deals with his parent being deployed and how you can relate that to children. Children can use this app, but then there are um, sections where an adult has to um, put in a code or put something in to access more information when it's a little bit heavier information about if somebody doesn't come home or somebody um, coming home with an injury. A really neat app. I'm going to have students that will work on military child um, care bases, military based child care, um, and this would be highly beneficial for them. So we discovered that one. Um, some of the tools that we used, um, Note Shelf, and I'll show you a little clip of how um, I had intended that we use Note Shelf. Um, Dropbox was one that we used because you didn't have the excuse that you don't have your paper now because it's everywhere. It's on every device that you own. Um, Pinterest, if you guys aren't Pinterest addicts, um, early childhood people are um, because it's, yeah. it's hoarding. It's hoarding pins. Um, and we um, got a lot of really great ideas from people's Pinterest sites or from blogs. Um, the students used Facebook um, because a lot of um, bloggers, early childhood bloggers, will have Facebook accounts or Facebook sites where you can get new information and ideas. Um, Animoto, uh, my students do a um, electronic documentation project and we use Animoto. That's one of the options, but Animoto works the best for us and it has an app so there's a lot of um, opportunities for us to use the iPad um, with the um, documentation project. Um, Kindertown, this is like a search engine for apps for early childhood. I think I've got a, yeah, a screenshot of it. You can decide what kind of device you have, pick the age group of child that you're working with, whether or not you want to pay for it or not, and of course we didn't. Um, and what area you wanted to target, and it would find apps for you. Um, my students use this a lot to find apps that may go along with a specific um, theme that they were doing or a specific domain that they were working in. Um, Common Sense Media website has a similar um, feature where you can put in um, the age of the child and what type of apps that you're looking for, and it will help you um, narrow down because there are more apps out there than I can imagine. So it's just absolutely amazing. But this was really, um, really helpful. And then the one part that we didn't explore as fully as I wish that we would have um, was using um, the iPad for assessment. We used it to kind of get an idea of if the kids knew um, certain letters or knew how to count. Um, but this, um, within a note shelf, I had envisioned us having a little notebook for each child and we take a picture of a child doing something that we need to document and we can record that um, observation right there with the picture. We can send that to parents through Dropbox. We can, you know, put a booklet together with, you know, as PDF files. It's really, um, I see a lot of opportunities still for this. I still talk to my students, even though we don't have iPads in that class right now, um, talk to my students about how you can use tools like this to help you do your job in um, assessing children. Um, with the documentation project, I could tell that they used their iPad, but not in this form. This was, this is what I was hoping for, but we had a lot of things going on. We had a lot of other things that were really cool that um, worked, so that I didn't feel it. It was lost, but the end results, my, uh, my, I say my kids, my big kids, um, were really excited about trying new things. Um, they were excited every day. They never forgot to bring their iPad to class because you never knew what we were going to do with them. Um, it gave them an opportunity to, you know, explore um, and see what was out there, to see what was available for their families. I think they were more comfortable in the end. Um, and I think it really increased the social aspect because they talked to each other more, plus it was a small group. Um, I had one student that had enrolled in my class for this spring, and she goes, I'm so excited because everybody got iPads. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. I said, they got them in the fall because it was a really small class, but there's 22 of you in this class. And 
We'll talk about it, but I, I don't have one to give everyone this time. I'm so sorry. Um, but it got people excited about um, the class. So we, I really enjoyed it, and um, we're still carrying over some of the things that we've learned in other classes and in um, the preschool, which is what was another good bonus of it. So, and that's all I have. You have any questions? You guys all want that xylophone app, I'll send it to you. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and using free apps, which I think is great. And there, there is a lot out there. And, and teaching students to uh, determine what, what's good mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and that critical thinking, I think, is a part of that. Uh, but I, and you may have mentioned this. Do you normally require a textbook for that class and you didn't use it? We have a text. We did. We have a textbook for that class and we went ahead and used it. Um, but I, I think it, they did a really good job with the amount of free apps that we had, which I think um, it did tease, tease them, teach them to be um, very choosy. And we did a lot of test driving of things, and you, we downloaded it and realized, mm, this is not good. Um, but we, there were a lot of really great free things out there, or at least the light versions where if they did want to go ahead and purchase it, um, I think a lot of my students after that semester ended up getting their own iPads because it was like a test drive to have it um, for that semester, so that was good. I let my kids keep it through Thanksgiving so they could ask their own grandpa. <laughs> 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 that is sneaky, Lori. <laughs> 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 All right. There we go. I'm Hazel Coltharp and I'm in the mathematics department and I'm my primary assignment is for math education so I teach the content for elementary but I also teach the methods course for the secondary and I um, decided to use this after seeing Ann George's presentation um, last year she had done something similar with her graduate course of, um, that was online and, and sort of counseling. I thought, well, I could do that with student teachers, so out in the field. So this was for um, Math 579, which is the um, common numbering for the methods course for secondary, and this was last fall with the student teachers. And um, not unlike, I didn't wrap them like Amber did, um, but they did come in and they were all very excited and Chelsea had to come separately so she, I said look excited and she <laughs> did. She's a very good person to look excited about. But um, my goal with this was to um, try to get these people um, a little bit of exposure to what they're going to be seeing out there in the classrooms they're going to. And a lot of times um, with a sort of a foot in both worlds, higher ed and, and, and uh, K-12, K-12 oftentimes is ahead of us, and so I kind of felt like even though, you know, we, there's a wide variety out there, I kind of thought that perhaps we should be <laughs> at least exposing them and trying to use some of these this technology. So I had a small group, and um, I thought it was a good opportunity um, to do that. So expectations for this. Um, I had a list of apps that I had actually uh, gleaned from a high school teacher here in Pittsburgh and I asked them to download those apps. Um, they were supposed to research and, and find one additional app because like Amber said and everyone said there are just hundreds of out there for mathematics. And so I had a list of required ones but I asked them and I also asked them to reflect on those but um, also to uh, find an additional one that they really liked and they really kind of enjoyed that. Some of the ones um, primarily most of them were free. Um, you can see uh, Common Core, uh, SketchUp, uh, which is a, like a Sketchpad, um, Geometry Sketchpad type of thing. A lot of math stuff there. Um, Khan Academy is always a good one for videos and things like that. Um, but these are some of the ones that uh, a, a practicing high school teacher actually used. The ones I actually asked them to buy, one was Wolfram Alpha, and if you're not familiar with Wolfram Alpha, I mean that's I mean that's that's who Siri asks. So I mean that's that's the uh, the be all and end all, um, and it was only a dollar ninety nine. I actually got mine for free, but because I was at a conference when they offered it for free. But 
and then Trig and Air, which is just $1.99. It's a Trig app. So the other ones, so those were more the mathematics apps, but the other ones I asked them to uh, download that were more sort of organizational things uh, like Evernote or Note Taker HD, which they could take notes with, uh, Sketch, which is a markup one, um, and iTunes U and, and Panorama, which is a camera type one. Um, I required them, to, and well, I sent them the invitation for Dropbox so that I would get more memory too. Um, but we use Dropbox, of course, Canvas, National Council of Teachers of Mathematics has an app, and Adobe Reader. So those were some of the ones that I required them to download, um, but they, did, they couldn't review those. Those weren't eligible for review. Another thing that, that um, sort of um, I had a goal of was to use them to record with. Um, a few years ago, well, no, we'll start even farther back, way back when I first started supervising student teachers, I'd do what everyone did. I'd go out and observe them and take a legal pad and a little script take and then sit down you know, with them and kind of go over it and then write it up and that kind of thing. And I, it, it, I go back to even as far as Mike Moderis. I said, Mike, can't I, I can videotape them. Can't I, you know, wow, video takes so much memory. There's, you know, no way we'll, well, of course, you know, we all know where that story's gone. So a few years ago, I, the math department purchased some flip cameras, the small little cameras, and then you just plug them in. And those have worked really well, but we're kind of starting to have issues. And of course, right after we bought them, Cisco said they're not supporting them anymore, which that was Dick Oh, yay. Um, but at least I got them um, when Amazon had a sale on them, so I, was, I didn't feel too badly. So I thought, well, again, like everybody's mentioned, this replaces so many things. This has got a camera, so they could set it up and record. And so I, I wanted them to record a lesson for review. Actually, I wound up doing it for them. And then to record an audio journal, we didn't make that kind of because of the way the semester worked, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, I also asked them, even if they weren't in an environment that they could actually teach that lesson plan, to come up with a lesson plan that incorporated, you know, one or more of the apps and, and um, sort of dream big type of thing. Um, on reflections, I asked them at the end of the semester to write a reflection about, you know, sort of the pros and cons of, of using the iPads in the situation. Um, the, some of the pros that they they mentioned was were the that they all learned sort of this together or this technology. Um, I had a couple of students. It was so funny. <laughs> some of the cooperating teachers were so almost as excited as the student teachers were because their district was just getting ready to implement and they had gotten iPads themselves. So they were like please teach me to the student teachers. So that was kind of neat. And, and one um, school district was going to iPads the next year, so they had given the math department um, iPads to use. And so their cooperating teachers were going to workshops to learn how to use. And that, that student teacher said, I got to go with my own iPad to the same workshop and act, you know, act like I was one of them. So that was kind of neat. Uh, one of them laughed and said that she, even though she didn't get a chance to use it a lot, she still felt like she had a, a marketable skill maybe that would separate her from, you know, other people uh, for landing a job, but um, she was positive about it. Um, one a student really liked the fact that he could quickly, you know, sketch something on his graphing calculator, show it to everybody, and then have the textbook as well, so that was kind of neat. Again, multiple things to do. Um, Lots of um, they had videos. One said that she didn't think that it would ever replace her as a teacher. And she wasn't really into the flip classroom, but she said she thought it would be really powerful if she recorded with it and then made that video re available so they could watch it over and over again, you know, when they got home, her students. So she didn't really believe in just totally flipping it and becoming the teacher, but providing one more source. So I thought that was really good. Um, Again, a lot of the school districts are moving to that one-on-one -on -one implementation. Um, one student said he really liked quick reference. He pulled it out and would look stuff up, just like we all do on Google or Wolfram Alpha or something like that, and used it for his music source during when they were taking tests or working on their homework or something like that. And he thought it was a lot less burdensome and, and handier than his laptop. He was pretty tech savvy. Again, one of the cons, she said, and I'm not saying it's a con, but she noted it couldn't she didn't feel like it could replace her as a teacher, which I think we'd all probably agree. Um, she, another one mentioned they, they always were looking for that perfect app that would combine, you know, they think they would find this one great app, but it just wouldn't have one thing that they really wished it would have, so I, I expect it'll be out there pretty soon. Um, some thought it slowed the lesson down, but that was because of the learning curve of everybody trying to get used to it, so I think that will be um, 
uh, improved upon as, as time goes on. And then not lack of school support necessarily um, philosophically, but just cost-wise. They were out there in schools where the internet wasn't very reliable or the bandwidth, <laughs> just the, you know, there were too many servers. I laughed at one student teacher whose school district was getting ready to go to it uh, next year said all the teachers were on and it crashed several times. He didn't know what was going to happen when they put like 240 kids on it too. So he kind of realized that overloaded servers were going to be a big problem for them. Um, and then um, some didn't even have a document camera they could even lay there, I bet. So that for me was, you know, kind of a, of a con. Um, it was sort of interesting um, because it was student teachers it wasn't a class like other people have had that have presented here. It was, I, it was literally I almost handed it to them and just said, go, play. And student teachers are back on campus every Thursday for about the first eight weeks. So I thought, well, I'll get to see them. And I always meet with them for lunch every other Thursday. We'll talk, we'll do everything. Well, it just so happens this coincided with the semester that uh, College of Ed um, teacher had decided to mix up the calendar just a little bit. And so I missed like three times that they would have been on campus that I could have met with them. So it was just, I mean, Jean Dockers heard about it quite a bit from me and would laugh. So I didn't get to be with them. So that was a real drawback for me of that missing that class time to discuss, to model, that kind of thing. So I kind of thought that was, um, you know, a big drawback to doing it just during student teaching. Um, also, it would be helpful to know, um, and, and we kind of did this on the fly, of what school districts had available to them in terms of support for it. You know, are they allowed to on the network, those kinds of things, because again, we had issues with, and I remember Ann talking about that, issues with internet and things like that. Um, so, you know, that was some, somewhat of a um, big point, and obviously I need more training myself, so that's, now, advice for next time. Uh, like I said, more consistent time. I think if I could get to them before student teaching and have them with a class setting like everyone else has had, that would be helpful because we'd have a lot more time to talk and, and troubleshoot some of these things. Um, I'd like to get out there and know, and I might have a uh, graduate assistant and a master's student that might be doing a project, which I'd kind of like her to do this for me, uh, to find what school districts in the area are doing and how they're implementing that. and. Um, try and get some more modeling in their pre-student teaching classes. Um, Cynthia Woodburn uh, you did the iPad project and, and she did it with her, uh, the geometry class for middle school people. So I'm sure I could get, you know, if we could get some more people to do it in the math department, that would be helpful. But it made me think, and so I'm going, I, just this week, with our student technology fee in the department, um, we were talking about different needs and I think I hit a year that we didn't have a horrible amount of request of technology. Um, I was going to request 12 um, iPads for the department with their student technology fee money to use. Now CJ just told me it'd be cheaper if I ordered in packages of 10 or so, so he said order 10 or 20. But um, this way they will have it during um, the semester they do their methods course with me. I also require them to do a clinical experience in conjunction with that so they're out in the classroom with it and for the high school people it could be the very same classroom that they'll student teach in the next semester. So those will get to keep it the whole year and you know we'll, during the, the semester I have them with uh, techniques etc. I can you know we can troubleshoot and we can model and we can look for apps and we can have that co um, collaboration that you just don't get when you see them once a week in student teaching. Um, then they'll go out and student teach. I lose a couple because a couple of them are middle school majors that are elementary ed or, or science or something like that. So I'll get theirs back and they'll be you know, wishing they were majors and give it to the next group. So hopefully we can just sort of do this. I mentioned the recording, uh, video recording of their lessons. Um, I did when I went out and taught, I mean it sort of just came to me and I took my iPad that um, I had. I just set it up and recorded their whole lesson. And College of Ed, I think, has purchased, you know, some video, video editing, commenting software that I can use that's related to their knowledge base. So I'm excited about doing that. And um, so I'll see how that works. But that worked really well to use that instead of the flip camera to just set it up and record. Um, 
I probably have similar requirements for them and um, I, my goal is this fall for the math department itself because we have a few people that you know the piece of chalk is the, the highest technology is to invite some of the local secondary teachers that are you know using this. Um, just sort of like I said word of mouth and Angela may even know and more than I do of, of the school districts in the area but for example, last fall, Humboldt, like I said, I had a student teacher there is going, you know, iPads. Galena, I had a student teacher at Galena, and his cooperating teacher is one of my former students as well. They are going to it next year, one-to-one. -one. But his wife was over at Baxter Springs, and they've already gone. I was talking, I thought Joplin was doing something, so I was with the South Middle School principal last weekend and asked Steve, I said, is, iPad, or is Joplin doing something with iPads? All eighth graders are going to have an iPad next year in Joplin. So it's kind of like, okay. so. It's out there, so I'd like to invite, um, and like I said, Rhonda Willis at Pittsburgh High is doing a complete immersion, and uh, my student teacher there was very, I didn't say anti-technology, but she kind of refuses to have a Facebook account. She's one of my advisees and my daughter's good friend, but it was so funny because of all the student teachers that are out this semester, she was the least technology-friendly one that we had, and here she's the one that ended up in a total iPad immersion classroom and she loves it so I you know but um, and and I can comment a little bit on my daughter's experience she's student teaching this semester um, I'm not supervising her because she's my daughter but um, she's at Colgan and Colgan has a variety but she happens to be in the same uh, classroom actually same teacher that I had when I student taught Chuck, Chuck Smith and Chuck is an excellent teacher but he does it all with a piece of chalk and one chalkboard and so she brings her iPad and her laptop, you know, in the classroom, and she'll quickly graph something. And she said, even if I had a document camera that I could put it under just to show them. So she literally just holds it up and shows them. And of course, she only has maybe five or eight kids, so they're all you know, looking around. Oh, how'd you do that? You know. So I think it does have a lot of of um, uh, really excitement for, especially mathematics, because it's kind of a tough subject sometimes to graph things and that kind of thing so that was ours and we'll be asking for some more okay. right. question? any questions okay. I make a comment, Angel. There, there are always groups buying iPads so if you work with student use and purchases you okay. can bulk the purchases and that way you could still get your 12 and maybe someone else is ordering 8, eight. Or something okay like that. He's really good about doing that if he knows about it coming down the line. I'll do that. I just heard that five minutes before I came over. Yeah. I see Jay was going, no, you want to do them in groups said, of 10. Yeah, so. He will say yes. And that's how you've done it, isn't it, Brenda? For yeah. the most part, just taking. It's a small savings. Small savings, yeah. but it helps. Yeah, for sure. For sure. We're looking to buy 15 in the department, hopefully. Okay. So we could fit with you guys. There we go. Thanks, Jamie. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paul Herring, and I teach over in the Engineering Technology Department. Here's what I'm looking for. In the Plastics Department. So I want to talk to you a little bit about something we worked on. We kind of uh, dovetailed in with the iPad pilot project, but it, it kind of happened before that, and it's been ongoing since last fall when I actually got some iPads to work with. But uh, in our plastics lab courses, I'm glad to see you, Brian, because you and I have talked about this stuff a lot. We have some challenges with a lot of different pieces of equipment. I have about 10 major industrial type machines that I work with, and some of these instructions on how to operate the machines are very complicated. I think it moved ahead on us. Yeah. So safety is essential. We have to have safe environment for the students. Uh, so we're always seeking new ways to deliver exercises and procedures and work instructions. In addition to safety, we also need to protect our equipment because if we break something, it's very expensive to fix it. Um, we also thought about ways to interface better with Canvas to be able to input lab results um, have students access the data on the web. Sometimes they need to know what temperature to run a machine or whatever and, and it's all out there and we can go access it. So 
we're kind of looking for a way to come into the 21st century with how we work in our lab. And talking with our folks in industry, they mentioned uh, the trend of the paperless factory, visual workplace, and I'm showing a photo of a lady at her workstation. So uh, there's not as many paper instructions or blueprints out in the factories anymore. And so we're trying to at least keep up a little bit with what's going on. We looked at a few software solutions that were out there. And I started working a little bit with this company called Everett Charles Technology, and their product is ProWorks. And I secured a trial license from them, and I got excited about it because I, I had this idea that we might try a tablet computer, and I'd had some discussions with my colleagues about it. And this company announced that they could now uh, interface with the iPad in the factory. So uh, we installed it. Um, I worked a little bit with Kylie and with Mike Smith on uh, setting up a server because the instructions would reside on a server and then the students would have to access those files when they called them up in the iPad. Uh, basically a remote desktop was how they were accessing it and we used a, a free app called Pocket Cloud and it let me log on to the server. It wasn't quite what I was led to believe it was. So uh, that was uh, what we worked with kind of early in the fall, late in the summer, early in the fall. So I applied to get some iPads. I had a small class and I thought I would have some students play around with this thing and experiment with it. So I received four iPads and I did not hand these out like, like a lot of you did. My purpose for this was as a tool in the lab. We keep them in the lab or in my office. When they come to lab, they check it out, they use it, they get their work done, and they turn it in when they leave. Um, we did a little bit of research on cases, and I, want, I was really concerned about damage. We have water, we have oil, we have different chemicals, um, we have cement floors, so. Uh, looked at some different options. I went with the Griffin Survivor, and I don't know if you guys have looked at that, but this one seemed to have the best uh, cushioning for impact, and it also has a screen protector, but uh, it's about $70 when you buy it at Walmart, but if you're not picky, if you don't mind pink or an exciting color like that, you can find them online much cheaper. But anyway, so, We, uh, I had some of the students go in and learn the software enough to where they could create a work instruction. And this is kind of what it looks like. There would be an outline of the steps and you could have photographs. And then when they had completed that step, they hit the green check mark and it would go to the next, uh, the next step in the process. But the ProWorks software was very complex. It's, it's an industrial product. They can track uh, how long it takes an employee to do a certain function. So they're doing uh, industrial design or industrial engineering time standards, those kind of things. It was really more than we needed for what I had in mind. Had a steep learning curve and it was cumbersome to get the photographs in there. Uh, and then, as I said earlier, it wasn't really a iPad application with that software, we had to kind of go around uh, another layer to get into um, the work instructions. So I presented this to uh, the Four State Conference and talked to some of my colleagues about it and I came across another software and this was right at the end of the semester and it's called Dozuki. And, uh, I talked with the company and looked at kind of the, the demo for the thing and I thought it might have showed some promise and uh, so early this semester after I'd turned in the iPads we were working with the uh, department issued iPad that I had and we, I had my class, I had another small class, I had them uh, go through an online demonstration with one of their sales reps 
and they offered to give us a license to the software. So the students went through training and uh, we've been working with it this semester. And what's kind of interesting, before the guy was done with about a 30 minute online presentation, three of the students had already downloaded the application on either their Droid or their iPhone because you can use it on, on those devices as well as the iPad. So they were excited about it. Um, so the way it works, you don't have a server computer in your, in your laboratory. It's housed on their server. They have free applications. And if you'd like to try it, uh, you could download the application and use this username and password. And uh, I'll show you how that works a little bit. It's very user friendly. And uh, I had to take some of my case off to be able to plug into this thing. My rugged case is uh, kind of a tight fit. Are we in business there? Yes, we are. Okay, so if you take a look at the, the application, it just comes up to the Suzuki and get started. And you'll see where it says more sites. And we actually have our own site. And you'll see uh, Cal Poly has uh, some of their guidebooks on using their equipment. Um, some of these are public sites. Some are private. And this is our site. And we have two categories of guides. One is lab activities. And I'll show you a, a work instruction or machine operation instruction. So one of them is for our angle injection molding machine. And it's just very simple. You have the ability to bring in photos or videos, drawings, and then you have uh, text that you can type in. Step two, turn on the electrical power. Step three, how you turn it on to the machine. So you can just keep adding steps. Turn on the water valve. Uh, like I say, it's much simpler than the other software. The students picked up on it and they have been writing work instructions and we're in the process of getting them uploaded. Uh, one other thing I'll show you, it's, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but you do have a few simple tools like you could put that red box or a circle and you can change the color to highlight an area. They are adding the capability to put some arrows and, and text, but it's, it's very basic, very simple. So that just gives you an idea of what it looks like on the iPad. Does it allow you to import the, do you take the picture while you're in Dozuki or do you have to import the picture? I'm just curious. We've imported the okay. pictures. Cool. Yeah, we went around and took all of the pictures. First the students would write out the steps, one, two, three, and then they would figure out where they needed photos. They'd go take the photos and then we'd upload them. Now you create the work instructions on the PC we're only using the iPad to view them, but you could, you could use Safari and get into our site. One other thing I wanted to point out, and it's, it's in the presentation, but while I'm here, to save some time. Um, we use an application called Numbers. It allows us to use Excel spreadsheets. And I paid $10 for, for this application. There might be some others, but uh, one of the ideas was, in addition to instructions, the students also uh, have some, some uh, data entry and graphing that they use in their experiments. And so this is a spreadsheet that we use, but um, they can use it right on the iPad if they use the numbers software. So there are several of these that we use. Um, another application in engineering technology, we, use, uh, we do solid modeling in a software called SolidWorks. There's also a free viewer that you can install to look at um, models and assemblies and blueprints. So we see a lot of applications in engineering technology um, in addition to a couple of more things that I want to show you right quick. Um, so as I said, the Dozuki software is much easier to use and that's what I'd like to go further with. Um, 
And like I also showed you, we were using the camera, both video and still camera, and using Safari or the Canvas application to actually upload the assignments. That's, that's where I want to head with this thing. So the students were receptive to this second product much more than the first one. They, they say they'd like to try using that in the lab to go paperless. Of course, that's what they always say, right? Um, they, they have the application on their phone. Um, they were actively involved in what they think is that the iPad might be too big because they're looking at it on their phones and it's usable on this size. So we might look into the iPad minis for our application if we decide to buy some. I'm not sure how much money that would save us, but um, I'd like to get a hold of one and try it and see if that might work better. It might be more uh, convenient or less apt to be dropped while they're in the shop. That's one of the ideas. Um, So I want to try to implement this thing. I'll be working on it this summer. And ideally, what I'd like to see is when the students arrive, they get the iPad. They use the Dazuki software to go through the operation and their, uh, their instructions. They might use numbers to do some Excel applications. And then I'm, what I'm trying to develop next, and I've talked with Kylie about it a little bit, is maybe I create a quiz in Canvas, and they would enter their data that way, then I can grade it, and it's in the grade book. And when they leave, they're done. So I don't know how I keep doing that. But in addition to these folks, Kylie let me uh, pick her brain quite a bit on this project. But these are the students that worked on it this semester. So any questions? It's kind of a different avenue than, than a lot of folks are looking at. but. Uh, we see some application, and I'm, I'd like to visit with you and your colleagues sometime, and Mark, about well, it. I just went and got the Zuki for free. Okay. <laughs> well, I can already see that it's well, this is kind of in your wheelhouse, right? Yeah, it's, it's got potential. It's really uh, Paul? Yes. Question. Yes. Um, with your use of numbers, how did the, it work? Um, did, you, did students, like, take their work from numbers and import it into Excel? How difficult was that movement, like to, like to, you know, a desktop or a notebook, PC with Excel? What I did was I put the Excel spreadsheet in Canvas, and then they were able to access it and bring it into the iPad. Okay. And then once it's in there, it's saved in the iPad, and then they just called that spreadsheet up and did the data entry. It's kind of clunky, but you click on the cell, and it brings up your keypad, and you can put the, the data in. Then they could save it, and they could even, uh, one thing we were experimenting with this week was you could just take a screenshot and then upload that. It's like a photo. We can put that back into Canvas, into the assignment box. That's the part that is going to be interesting to work on over the summer, figuring out what makes sense with that part of it. Did that answer your yes, question? Yes, some of the reviews of getting from a math-based spreadsheet back into Excel are variable in terms of how well it works, so I'm just curious. We haven't tried that. Once, once we had it on the iPad, that's, that's where we were using it, so. Any other questions? Was the app, the, the drawing app that you have on there, uh, eDrawing Pro, that was on your Yes. Uh, is that a viewer, or is that you can draw in it? It's a viewer, and, and I, I'm not quite sure. I'd have to look. There's one version that was free. There's one that might cost $5 or $9. And in that one, you can mark up things and communicate. But uh, OK, thank you very much. I'm Marty York, and I teach in the College of Teaching or in the Department of Teaching and Leadership. Um, and I used the iPads with my SPAD 450 class, which is methods in teaching preschoolers with disabilities. So Amber and I did work pretty closely together. And like she said, some of my students were her student teachers. So it, 
it was kind of an embarrassment of riches. You looked pretty fancy in the preschool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I had a class of 16 people, so a, a little bit bigger group than some of the ones that were talked about. Um, Amber and I shared one student, so that person only got one iPad, um, so, which worked out well. Um, so the goals that I had for the project were kind of twofold. The first one was that I wanted the students to be able to identify apps that could be used with kids. And we did that to a certain extent, and Amber kind of in the same way that Amber did, and then because there was so much overlap, we kind of shared those back and forth. Um, and then the second, goal was to use the iPad because I created, I, I, it really did help me to create, use a backward design with this class, and they became a school. So there, 16 people, we divided them into four groups. Each group was a classroom within our school. And each classroom had eight students. It was mathematically fabulous because if I had, you know, need to have multiples of four, I don't know how you do that in, in Gus. <laughs> um, but, so I wanted to explore how it, the iPad could be used by the students as if they were teachers making lesson plans, managing data for students, and that kind of thing, um, and writing individualized education plans. Um, so let's talk about the first goal first, and then we'll talk about the second one. Um, these are comments from the students that they made. I gave them a survey at the end of the semester. Um, it's, in terms of pre-academic skills, the apps made targeting children of certain ages easy and productive. Um, they liked the games. They felt like the iPad could, would be a really good tool to use as kids go through preschool to help them get ready for kindergarten. Communication skills. Um, unfortunately, the, the really good communication board programs are a couple hundred dollars. And for the amount of use that we would give them as students, I didn't really explore that to a great extent. But iPads are being used by individuals with disabilities as communication devices. We used to have freestanding communication devices that were built just for that purpose, and the iPad has a lot of those same components, so that the person could use icons similar to these and say, I would, if they went into McDonald's, they could say, I'd like a quarter pounder with cheese and a Coke. And you push on that icon, and the iPad speaks for you. Uh, for individuals that are in wheelchairs, the iPad then can be mounted to their wheelchair tray and it becomes something that, it becomes their mode of communication. But because the ProLoquo program is so expensive, I and for as little use as we would give it as students, I didn't choose to try to pursue purchasing that. But um, we did look at the way, I mean, we talked about that in class, about how this could actually be used as a communication device. And of course for the people, for nonverbal students and for individuals, adults with disabilities, it's a, it's a lifesaver. I mean, it's not, it's, this is not something that would be an extra by any means. This is something that is required in order for people to actually communicate with each other. So. Um, the other, the other thing that I wanted to use the iPads with were for social stories. Social stories are something that are used by preschoolers. Um, um, 
to, kids will freak out sometimes, kids with autism particularly. They get into a situation where they don't know what's coming up next and they're not happy. Like we have meltdowns, we cry, we fuss, we fight. One of the tools that is really being used frequently right now is the use of social stories with those kids. And so what you do is create a social story, and this is one of the ones that the students created for this class. So let's assume that this little guy throws a fit every morning when he has to brush his teeth. Maybe he doesn't like the feel of the toothbrush in his mouth. Or maybe he just doesn't know what's coming next. So in the morning, and I get up and brush, before I brush my teeth, I go to the bathroom and I wet my toothbrush. Then I put, how, shows how much toothpaste to put on there. Then I put it in my mouth and brush my teeth and then brush the front teeth and then I spit the toothpaste out. It's task analyzed, the, the task of brushing your teeth, one of an early morning routine for a student, into tiny little steps. We have been printing those out and laminating them because you don't give unlaminated paper to a three-year-old unless you only want to use it once. Um, and reading it like a storybook before toothbrushing time or before, it could be getting on the bus, it could be um, leaving home, it could be who's going to pick me up today, mom or grandma. Anything that the student is feeling uncertain about or that they're having a struggle with can be put into a social story and then you read the social story daily right before that task and it will help the child to understand what the task is about and they've been fabulously successful. Now some, some kids will need more repetition with the story than others. Other kids will be, I've heard stories about one of my students created a social story for one of her kids they read it once and the problem was over and it never happened again. Life usually doesn't work quite that well. But the iPad for either viewing or creating social stories. Now I didn't find a program that I fell in love with in terms of creating the social stories on the iPad. We did quite a bit of exploring and there were four social stories submitted and they were each in a different medium. So, um, but the PowerPoint was the one that was the most successful, still. Um, I was, I looked into doing, I, what is it, iBook or iBook Creator in, uh, through Apple. And they do have a program, but my, even on my computer, my operating system isn't new enough to do it. And I, I just kind of discarded that idea then because I have a pretty new computer and if it wasn't going to work on mine, I didn't want to frustrate the kids and go, put them to any more expense. Um, so, but certainly if you can, you can download the PowerPoint onto an iPad and use that as your storybook and keep a whole collection of different stories available and ready for use at any point in time. So mom would just carry the iPad around in her diaper, in the diaper bag and anywhere we go, if we had run into one of those issues, I had a little guy that I actually worked with some kids um, a few years ago, and my little guy was having trouble with um, going into restaurants, and he would see kids at the other table with matchbox cars, and they'd try to go over and get the matchbox, and you know he didn't understand that. You play with your own toys at the table, but we don't run around the restaurant and try to get everybody else's toys, too. So we wrote a social story for that one to help him get through that situation. So um, in terms of creating the social stories, it wasn't all that. We didn't come up with a program that we were in love with, but in ter certainly in terms of viewing them. Um, other apps and games, there were the kind of some categories that came about, and we did find quite a few of the ones that Amber talked about. Um, one of the students has a two-year-old at home, and so she had she was a, actually able to field test them. Um, I had wanted there is a field experience component to this class, 
but it's not a practicum. So we're not, we don't take over the class at any point in time. Um, I had wanted them to take the iPads and try out some of these apps with the kids, but it interfered with the schedule of those classrooms, and so that didn't happen to the extent that I had hoped either. Um, using the iPads as a tool, this, what the students did was create children. Um, so each class had eight children in it. Um, and they, each of those eight children had an IEP. So they had to figure out what, what disability do those kids have. Now in a real life, they would have some non-disabled kids in the classroom as well. We didn't focus so much on those. Then they wrote modified, not the whole thing, but they wrote IEPs for all eight of the students. And that, this is the part where it, the iPads enabled us to use a backward design because I pretty much left all of the PowerPoints on Canvas for them to view in their own time. And when they came to class, they were a working faculty. And they worked through all of these assignments in their groups in class. Now they used Google Docs through Canvas. And that was another place where we had medium success. Um, it was a little bit difficult to enter the through the iPads into Google Docs, that the Google the Google Docs wasn't all that friendly to the to the assignment, but the idea of having them create all of those things, then turn them in on Canvas, and I could view them, that was fabulous. And I will run the class next fall in a very similar way, and I we need to figure out a way not to have to go back to paper, but um, I was very pleased with their ability to work together as groups. And we had a few low conflicts. We had a moment or two, <laughs> um, which was, I was hoping for that because when they get out of school, they're going to be working in teams with other women and they're going to have to figure out how to straighten those kinds of things out. So um, I was pleased about that. Um, embedded learning opportunities are ways that activities that work on their IEP objectives are planned into the routine and the activities of the day. And so they use those and primarily through Google Docs again. This is the structure of the classroom. So we had our four different classes and these would be the eight kids for each group. Um, so how did it go? We used the Google Docs to share information about the assignments. It worked okay. Um, and the, the students enjoyed finding the apps but didn't get as much opportunity to try them as we had hoped. These were some of the comments that the students made. Um, thank you for allowing us to use the iPads. They were very helpful when doing assignments. Now I'm aware of the benefits that it has for young children. Um, and the other one said, I love the iPad project, um, really helped with our class activities. So I think it did open their eyes about how these things could be used. And even when I went looking for some apps today, there were new ones on there that I hadn't seen three, four months ago. So each time around, it's going to be a different as time goes on, it's going to be more and more efficient and less frustrating. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.